All right. Good morning. Good morning. Um, that last song was amazing. <laughs> I don't feel like I have anything left to say. It had the whole gospel in there, so that was really good. Um, I'm not supposed to be here this week. I feel like that most weeks, but it's really true this week. I wasn't supposed to be here. Um, first, I want to thank uh, like Anna and Lisa and Grayson. They're filling in for me in, in Children's Church and for other people. Um, I know lots of people are sick this week and other things. Um, if you don't already know, uh, Yuri fractured his knee. He was supposed to preach this week and uh, let me know. that uh, Asked me to fill in for him. So if, if you do know Yuri, uh, text him during church. Say, oh, sorry to hear about your knee, but uh, make sure you tell him you're happy I'm preaching instead of him too. So uh, that would be nice. Uh, I need to pray and just ask that the Spirit be with us as we uh, continue today. Dear Lord, I do ask that you would be with Yuri. Dear Lord, heal his knee quickly. May he know that you are watching over him. Dear Lord, I pray for those that couldn't be here today because of sickness or other reasons. Dear Lord, that you would meet them, that you would speak to them. Dear Lord, but in this room right now, I just ask that um, your word would be spoken. Dear Lord, that uh, you would come through your scripture, that you would come through... uh, the believers that are next to us, dear Lord, that we may hear your voice, that we may know you, may we have reassurance and comfort and peace, knowing that uh, you are with us, you love us, and you have saved us, dear Lord. So I pray this in your name. Amen. All right. Uh, last week, Samson started us on the book of First Peter, uh, and I hope we like it, because we're going to be there for a really long time. Uh, We're going to go through it a few verses at a time. I have three whole verses I'm going to do today. And uh, yeah, just each week we're going to go through it. But last week, uh, Samson set it up really well. He set up first, he set up the author of 1 Peter, who is Peter. Uh, Lots of us know him from the Gospels. He's the one that walked with Christ, once even walked on water for a little bit. Preached with the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. He was a fisherman, so probably uneducated, and just a man that uh, that God really used. Uh, At this point, when he was writing this book, I think Samson said it was about 30 years he'd just been ministering and serving the small group of believers that had happened uh, since Jesus had resurrected and Pentecost. Uh, He's kind of stepped into uh, the leadership role, in some ways, of the early church. Um, Not necessarily because he wanted it, but because, again, he was an apostle. He'd walked with Christ, and he'd heard his his words. Uh, The audience, though, for this this book is unique. Um, If we're used to reading books from Paul, he would write to, like, one place, one group of people, and really, like, he would name people. Like, these are the people I want to hear this and to know this and do this. Uh, Peter is writing to a group of people uh, called, he calls aliens or foreigners, like Samson explained before. Uh, it wasn't in one place. They were scattered throughout. Uh, now it's kind of modern Turkey. But even beyond that, this letter could have passed to any church in any place. Uh, Christians that were uh, being spread out at that time in the world. And the reason they were being spread out is partly because of the uh, persecution at the time. Uh, Well, Jews didn't like the Christians and drove them out of Jerusalem into other places because of what they called their blasphemy, claiming Jesus was God. And then the Romans didn't like them for some complicated political reasons, but also just blaming them for ruining Roman culture and pulling them away from uh, the gods and and what they were supposed to be worshiping. So the people Peter is writing to had a very dangerous existence at the time. And uh, it's a little bit hard for me to imagine it because we're sitting in this comfortable room. It's a pretty nice place. Uh, We're very blessed. Many of us have our family near us. it is raining, but, I mean, it's nice. It's not too hot. I have a baby at home. It's nice when it's not too hot. Um, but as we read this, I want you to picture, can you imagine somebody, you're going to speak directly to them, someone who, who knows Jesus, 
they have faith in Jesus, but they also know that having that faith would cause them to lose their finances, possibly lose their family, even their own life. Uh, what would you say to that person? What would you give to that person? And that's what Peter has set himself up to do here, speak to those, to those people. Um, all right, so we're going to begin in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 5. Uh, it says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. All right, it's packed with lots of stuff in there, lots of words, uh, things like that. But the one that stuck out to me in verse 3 especially was this phrase, uh, born again. Uh, uh, raise your hand if you remember the uh, 1900s. Anybody in the room, the late 20th century, as we, we now have to refer to it. Um, it, this, this term born again was actually used quite a bit when I was a kid in the church I grew up in and the people that they were talking about. Kind of from the 60s into the 70s and into the 90s, it became this term where people uh, were trying to find a difference between them and what it meant to be kind of a cultural Christian. So the idea was, um, I'm not just one of those Christians who goes to church because my family makes me go to church, or I'm not just one of those people who you know, dresses up nice and, and says all the right words, but I have a, a personal relationship with, with Jesus. Um, it, it has caused me to be different than I want to be, possibly stand out from uh, other people around me, and uh, often it, it's supposed to be associated with... Uh, being personally detrimental to who you are. Calling yourself a born again was supposed to be a sign of uh, my life is harder, my life is difficult. So when I was a kid, the story that was uh, passed around a lot was someone called uh, Chuck Colson. And he wrote a book called Born Again. And so uh, he was an advisor to President Nixon uh, and in his book, he explains all the terrible and awful things he did for Nixon to help him become president, help him maintain his power, all of this. If you're not familiar, I, I understand this is ancient history. But uh, in the, at that time period, uh, Nixon was caught uh, in a crime, asking people to break into a building and just find information on his political rivals. Chuck Colson uh, was accused of helping with that and said he didn't do it, but he also knew he had all these other illegal, terrible, awful things he'd, he'd been doing to help Nixon throughout this time. And so when the president is uh, uh, indicted and all of that's happening, he's also experiencing Christ. Someone shares Christ with him, helps him see this in a new way, and he, uh, he decides he needs to confess. And so he actually stood up and said, no, I did not commit those crimes you accused me of, but here's the other crimes I did, and stood up and shared those and got, uh, I think it was five years in prison uh, because of his self-confessed crimes uh, that he uh, gave to all the world. Uh, and so he went into prison. Uh, while he was there, started sharing this gospel that he felt convicted of, that he was born again. God had changed him, made him into a new person and uh, started sharing this with other prisoners, uh, started a ministry in prison. Even after he got out, still would go and visit uh, prison fellowship. Uh, and so this uh, ministry is in all sorts of different countries all over the place uh, because this man uh, was born again. God found him, changed him, and uh, made him into a new person. And he would say over and over again, this wasn't, this wasn't him. He wasn't this great person. Here's proof. I'm not a great person. Uh, I was born again. So that's, that's the cultural phrase I came with when I read this. But uh, Peter didn't get it from Chuck Colson, obviously. He got it from Jesus. And one of the more famous passages of the Bible, so we're going to read from uh, John chapter 3. Uh, and this is uh, verses 1 to 8, and then we'll, we'll skip to uh, verses 6 to 18. 
16 to 18, sorry. So John chapter 3, verses 1 to 8 says this. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, sorry, that was mine. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. And then later, down below. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And so uh, this verse, John three sixteen, for God so loved the world, comes just after Jesus explains this idea that you have to be born again. And I think Nicodemus had what um, would be the first time hearing that phrase would be the, the normal reaction so I'm supposed to go inside my mother again? And, and come, like, how does this work? This is weird. Uh, it's, it's become Christianese now. But at the time, it was like, what does this mean to be born again? It was a very strange, weird concept. right? But the idea is, because of what Christ did, um, we are not the same person we used to be. We're a new creation. And this creation is part of spirit and light and truth. Um, it was God's mercy that allowed this to happen. Like the song we just sang, um, we were lost, we, had no, we were suffering under sin, and then Christ came and showed, oh wait, there's this whole new life. You can be this whole different person. You don't have to worry about sin. Right? But uh, that difference, to go from that old life to the new life, is a, a big jump which is why I think born again is a good phrase. It's, it's like starting all over. It's like becoming a new person. Uh, I'm going to come back to the word again. It's like you have become an alien, right? You've become uh, someone who's in this world, but you're not from this world. You're not of this world. This world is not what you're focused on. It's not, it's not who you are. Uh, so one of the biggest obstacles I found when talking to people uh, about like this jump, is um, if I'm going to believe in Jesus, uh, how can God allow so many terrible things to happen? Right? Or if God loves me, then why does he let me suffer? Uh, it, it doesn't make sense. How can, like, many people have this idea that if I become a new creation, I will not suffer. My life will be great. Everything will be good. Um, if this were true, if this was a promise of the scripture, everybody would be becoming Christians instantly, all the time, everywhere, right? They'd be flocking to it. It'd be amazing. Sign up. No more problems in your life. You're good, right? But it's, it's not the promise that we're giving, right? Um, another synonym for uh, alien would be the, the foreigner. Um, I've lived in three different countries in my life. Uh, many of you have lived in different countries, come from other countries, and done that. Um, it's a difficult life, uh, especially when you first move. Being a foreigner is difficult. And what I would always do when I would get to a new place is seek to, as quickly as possible, adapt and conform to the place I have moved to. Like, find my place where I'm at. Learn some language, learn some rules, the customs, the things I need to do so I can make my life here as comfortable and easy as possible. Like, just let me get comfortable and I'll be good. I can say this is where I live. This is where I'm supposed to be. But uh, Christians are called to be permanent foreigners, permanent aliens. We're supposed to always be uncomfortable in this world where we're at. 
and it's going to lead to, uh, to suffering. Our message to the people around us, either by what we say or what we do, is uh, you're a sinner, you're a terrible person like me, uh, but the good news is that Jesus knows how terrible you are, and he died for you anyways. Accept this gift of grace. But it's so hard to get past those first two phrases, right? You're a sinner, you're a terrible person just like me. How can you accept that? It, it's going to cause suffering. If that's what you're saying to people, <laughs> you're not going to have a lot of friends often. So, uh, again, Jesus says it better uh, in John 15, uh, verses 18 through, through 26. It says this. If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you are of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. Remember the word I have said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. I can't imagine his followers went up after that. Jesus was the perfect man. He came to seek and save lost people. He healed people. He brought people back from the dead. They hated him, tortured him, and killed him. You're his follower. Can you expect (laughs) more or or better treatment than than what he received? Uh, In uh, Matthew chapter 5, it says this. Verses 43 through uh, 48. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Therefore you are to be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Um, (laughs) I feel like I'm making this sound as as terrible as possible. right? This new life that you're promised, that Peter's talking about, uh, that you're blessed with, does not sound appealing. Uh, Remember that audience we were talking about. It wouldn't be appealing to them to set up themselves apart. Uh, uh, this is part of the reason why I know and believe that uh, it's God who calls people. Right? It's God who convicts people. It's God who even gives people the faith. Because uh, looking around, it doesn't seem that attractive. Depending on where you grew up, it might have been. But here we can see uh, it's really not something people strive for or gain uh, if they're looking with eyes of the world. Peter knew this probably better than most people. Um, And he reminds us in verse 3 that Jesus rose from the dead. And when he did this, we became his children. So yes, we become children in this world, uh, aliens, right? But we have gained a a new family. We've gained uh, a perfect father in heaven. We've gained many imperfect but righteous brothers and sisters around the world. Uh, it's our faith that unites us despite all of these things, right? We have differences in language, fashion, diet, culture, politics, personality, many, many differences between Christians throughout the world. But it's the Holy Spirit that binds us together. And uh, with this family, we are promised by our Father an inheritance. So all the way back again to First Peter, where we started, verses 4 to 5. It says, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Um, When I was a kid, uh, it was also very popular to just kind of try and imagine what heaven would be like. Um, Revelation describes it somewhat in different ways, but uh, you know, all my uh, visions, everything was just connected to stuff I had on earth. Like this food I like, I would get a whole lot more of that food. 
uh, this car I liked, I would get to drive it just like all the time, all those things. Like it was just this earth, but you know, turned up a little bit. Uh, I do not think that is the inheritance that Peter's talking about here. Just like our, our, our life, our family here, it's going to be different now from our earthly one. Our inheritance is also different. It's special. It's imperishable. It's undefiled and will not fade away. Nothing on earth is that way. Nothing we can point to, we can look at, we'll say, oh, that will be here forever. Oh, that's, that's perfect. There's nothing wrong with it, right? It's always, over time, going to fade away. It's, it's going to gonna be messed up. Uh, about two years ago, uh, my uncle passed away. I hadn't been close to him for a really long time, uh, but it was still kind of shocking, uh, uh, especially, you know, none of us kind of knew his condition and things like that. Uh, I'd had other people I knew die before this, and, uh, but this was the first time as an adult where I got to see what happens after somebody dies. Uh, my father became the executor of my uncle's estate, and so uh, everything my uncle owned was put in my dad's hand, and he had to figure out how to distribute it. Uh, he had some estranged sons who had to be contacted and told, you know, your father died, and he had to figure out, like, how much does each person deserve. Um, as we were going through this stuff, my uncle had a, a very nice Harley uh, motorcycle, which uh, I have some pictures of me sitting on. And uh, I remember that motorcycle, and I remember also that feeling of, of like wanting the motorcycle, and then also the feeling that came afterwards, the feeling guilty, knowing that, like, oh, the only reason I could get that motorcycle is because my uncle died, and do I care about the motorcycle more than I actually cared about my uncle? And, like, really defiling his memory with my, you know, coveting and my desiring of this. And then also part of, like, going through his stuff was there was just a bunch of junk. There was so much junk. But you had to go through it and look at it and sift through it and then distribute it. It was, it was a very painful, annoying process. It was not, like, a happy, here's a lottery, you get a bunch of stuff. It was... Yeah, it, was, it felt defiling in some ways to, to be going through all of these things. And so for the believer in Christ, our inheritance is not money. It's not belongings. It's not even kind of a, a legacy that we leave behind. Like, oh, everybody will remember you are a great person. Our inheritance isn't in a bank, and it's not protected by the government. Our inheritance is in Christ and God, and we trust that no matter what happens here, if we've clung to Christ, if we've clung to Jesus, everything after that will be much better. Our inheritance will be stored in heaven, and it will be great and good and beyond our imagination. In Romans chapter 8, verses 35, it says this. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? For just as it is written... For your sake, we are being put to death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. At the beginning, I asked you to kind of imagine that person who's persecuted, knowing everything can be taken away from them, their family, their life. What would you say to them? My first reaction, my first thought was to tell them how they could escape that persecution. Here's some tricks. If you live here, you go here. You know, you say this word instead of that word. Dress this way instead of do that. Your life will be so much better. Peter does not do this at all. He dives right in and says, I'm going to give you some promises and truth so that you can hold to this, no matter what happens around you, no matter what's going on. So don't focus on grasping what is inevitably going to go away. It's all going to pass away. Focus on what you have, what's been given to you, which cannot be taken away. And so my last uh, passage here um, is in Matthew again, chapter 6. Verses 25 to 34 it says this. For this reason, I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, 
nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, that they do not sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And who of you, by being worried, can add a single hour to his life? And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these, did not clothe himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you? You of little faith, do not worry then, saying, What will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear for our clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. For your heavenly Father knows your need and all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Uh, if you look at church history and tradition, what happened to the disciples was not a pleasant thing. All, all, if not most of them, were tortured, eventually killed for their faith and those things. Uh, many books filled with just martyrs who died for their faith. The takeaway for me this week, I hope, is uh, to see how blessed I am, to see how secure I am, and that the small trials around me, what I eat, what I do at work, all of this does not compare to God who created all things. He overcame death, found me, <coughs> saved me, and can take care of anything that's going to happen from here on out, whether I live or die. And so I uh, hope we can take from, from what Peter said to these people and, and just remember that this week as we, we go forth. Dear Lord, I thank you for you. Pray this week that we could be renewed with your spirit, dear Lord. May we see our inheritance, dear Lord, our true inheritance, the things that come from you and from no one else, dear Lord, the things that are undefiled, don't pass away, last forever, dear Lord. Thank you for coming down into our, our suffering, dear Lord, and suffering more than even we do. Living through that, dying, rising again, and showing that uh, in you there is peace, there is hope, there is love beyond measure, dear Lord. So I pray this week we, we may see heaven in your name. invite you to stand up. We're going to we're going to end our time together today.